On the morning of 24 August 1914, Paul Wittgenstein woke up with a feeling of doom. Deep in the pit of his stomach he sensed that something dreadful had happened. He opened his eyes and saw a hospital ward. It was very quiet. The nurses went about their business tending to patients in the row of beds opposite him. Only then did he realize that he too was confined to a hospital bed. But what language were these nurses speaking? Certainly it wasn't his own language, Austrian-German. And how did he get here? Why was he in a hospital? All he could feel was a dull pain in his right arm. Slowly it now started to come back to him. Austria, his native country, was at war. He was an officer in the army. And he had been sent eastward as part of a major offensive against Russia. The Austrian army had quickly advanced into Poland. There hadn't been any major battles yet. And now the memory of his last assignment came back to him. Yes, he had been dispatched with a small reconnaissance unit to report on Russian troop movements, the size of their units and the strength of their ammunition. But what happened after that? Only sights would come to him. A forest, a grassy plain, an exchange of fire. That was the last he could remember. The pain in his right arm started to really bother him now. He looked and saw that the arm was heavily bandaged. Curiously enough, the bandage stopped just short of his elbow. Or rather, where his elbow used to be. His head fell back on the pillow. Slowly he began to process the enormity of what he had just seen. He, Paul Wittgenstein, the celebrated, internationally renowned concert pianist, had lost his right arm. His career had come to an end. And yet he had no time to let that realization properly sink in. There were shouts coming from the doors to the ward. He saw a soldier cursing at a nurse, knocking her aside. The soldier had a Russian uniform. So did two other soldiers who were stationed by the doors. Wittgenstein realized immediately what that meant. Before hostilities had well and truly started, he had already become a prisoner of war. It was hard to imagine a worse catastrophe. All he could hope for now was a quick and decisive victory for Austria before he and his companions would perish of hunger, cold and disease in remote prison camps. But that victory would never come. In the end, ironically, it was the loss of his right arm that would qualify him for early release, as part of the exchange of disabled war prisoners between Austria and Russia. Two years after his capture, he would be back in Vienna, and soon he pl started planning his comeback, now as a one-handed concert pianist. Not that there was a great deal of repertoire for the left hand, yet he came from a rich family and had enough wealth to commission new compositions by the major composers of his time. Not just solo pieces, but large-scale piano concertos. And just this is what he proceeded to do in the next few years, and throughout the rest of what would prove to be a highly successful career. Composers happily took on his commissions. A piece for the left hand alone poses a special creative challenge, and they welcomed it. The concert grand piano is an instrument of enormous musical and technical capabilities. 
how to compare it to a small upright piano. The comparison is like that between the mini speakers on my iPhone 6 and the expensive speaker system in a movie theater. At a length of 9 feet, the Concert Grand has a massive soundboard that amplifies the string vibrations to the point where the music can easily fill the whole of Carnegie Hall. In grand pianos, the bass strings are twice the length of those in upright pianos. The difference in sound is like that between two different instruments altogether. In its own way, the human hand is also an instrument of enormous musical capabilities. In theory, it might seem that the loss of one hand must lead to a 50% reduction in technical capability. But in practice, that's unlikely to be true. We have already seen in the first lecture that the nervous system is capable of developing amazing workarounds, solutions that are simply not available to people without a disability. Still, even if the reduction of technical capabilities was exactly 50%, should that mean that half the piano's capabilities would lie musically unused as well? Herein lay the challenge for the composer, to get everything out of the instrument, 100% of it, with one hand. The most obvious capability to exploit is that of pitch range. Remember the ancient Ho Roman hydraulus we saw in Lecture 2? It had only eight keys to cover the range of one octave. The modern piano has 88 keys, and they cover altogether more than seven octaves. In the everyday piano repertoire for amateurs like me, the outer ranges are seldom explored. I can't recall ever playing a piano piece with a range exceeding about four octaves, though it's possible that there is some piece that has slipped my mind. However that may be, in a piano concerto, the challenge is to explore the full sonic possibilities of every register. Even if the left hand has to do it on its own, unassisted by its right hand companion, such exploration is among the composer's primary objectives. By far the most famous of the left hand piano concertos commissioned by Wittgenstein is that by the French composer Maurice Ravel. It is item number 84 of the awesome mix. Ravel completed the concerto in 1930. In the remaining seven years of his life, the work has given him much grief. The story goes that Wittgenstein could not deal with the extreme technical difficulties of the piece and begged Ravel to simplify it. But the composer was as uncompromising as he had been during the process of creation. He had written a concerto that was playable with the left hand. Perhaps not Wittgenstein's left hand, but that was not his problem. Unfortunately, Wittgenstein proceeded to play this rapturally beautiful concerto in any way he pleased, making up in showmanship what he lacked in musicianship. There are still recordings of his performances around. You can find some of them on YouTube. They are unlistenable. Ravel's piano concerto is famous for his long cadenza. I will explain that term after the fall break. For now, let me just describe a cadenza as an extended passage shortly before the end of a concerto in which the soloist has the stage all to herself and the orchestra remains silent. This is the moment for the solo instrument to pull all the stops, as it were, and show the full range of what it can do. In his cadenza, Ravel more than delivers. The left hand covers virtually the whole range of the keyboard. It revisits some of the melodies heard earlier in the concerto and outlines them with the thumb, while both the thumb and the other fingers provide continuous harp-like accompaniment, freely roaming across the wide span of the keyboard. Take a moment to see and hear the cadenza in this video clip. There are no words to describe the sheer marvel of this section.
The modern concert grant represents the culmination of a long process of expansion. It offers a range of pitches that most of us will rarely need, and that nobody ever expected to need in a keyboard instrument until about 200 years ago. What drove the expansion from that point onward was undoubtedly the model of the Romantic Symphony Orchestra. The piano brought the whole symphonic repertoire within reach of those people who could not afford to visit concerts on a regular basis. The most famous orchestral works of the day circulated in piano transcriptions. You could play them at home and in this way get to know them inside out. Now, if you wanted to appreciate the full, full extent of orchestral music, you were obviously going to need a keyboard well beyond the range of the garden variety piano repertoire. So that is one reason why the keyboard expanded so greatly. Yet today, we can hear any symphonic work any number of times in any number of recordings. And so we rarely visit the outer reaches left and right anymore. This expansion of musical range is an interesting historical development also in other periods. Look at this chronological chart. At the bottom of the table you see the numbers 13 to 40. These are items of the awesome mix. Since the awesome mix is strictly in chronological order, one can mark off the centuries at the top of the chart. 1200 to 1600, that's four centuries. Within the chart, we see a red line moving in the direction we'd like everything to move, that is, up. But what is it that's moving up? For this, we go left, to the beginning of the 400-year period. The three figures 1, 2 and 3 stand for cumulative octave spans. So when the graph starts with awesome mix number 13, we can tell from the red line that this piece has an overall range of about one and a half octaves. That is already more than the three-part composition by Master Albert of Paris, number 7 in the awesome mix, which we heard in the previous lecture. Its range of about one octave was totally satisfying because what we heard was effectively close harmony. There's no question that the upward trend in this graph did indeed take place between 1200 and 1600. The differences are dramatic when you hear them. And when a piece breaks new ground, like for example number 34, you can tell that the composer had to invent new solutions to musical problems that didn't exist before. Within the sample that is the awesome mix, you could say that number 34 breaks through a ceiling. I've represented that ceiling by the dotted white line. The line stands for a combined range of about two and a half octaves. After number 34, no piece comes below that line. Before it, no piece ever rose above. On the strength of this graph, you could make a similar point about number 20, except that it is the first of the awesome mix items to exceed one and a half octaves. Another piece that appears to have such historical significance is number 29. And yet, however interesting and important all this may be, the graph gives no hint of the most significant expansion of pitch range during this period, one that would change the face of music forever. This expansion occurred only a little after the year 1300, right there in that uneventful stretch. It is clearly audible in numbers 21 and 22. And once you've heard it, you'll recognize it immediately in other works. Let's go back one last time to the hydraulis we encountered in the floor mosaic of a dining room in a Roman villa. Eight organ pipes mounted into the water organ at a level marked by the uninterrupted horizontal line. The longest organ pipe is all the way left. It produces the lowest pitch. Let's draw a dotted horizontal line there. The distance between the two lines defines the lowest pitch. Then we go to the other side to the shortest pipe, which sounds the highest pitch. We draw another horizontal line and find that its distance to the line below is exactly half that of the lowest pipe. 
it follows that the shortest pipe sounds the octave above the longest. Altogether, the octave includes eight organ pipes, as I said a moment ago, and that is the exact number of the diatonic scale. That scale sounds like this. Yet I have said also that there is such a thing as a chromatic scale, which includes the black keys of the modern piano and organ keyboards. Chromatic means literally colorful, so black is not quite the most apposite term. But yet, however that may be, this is what the chromatic scale sounds like. So, here we are on the time chart, having arrived shortly before the invention of chromatic pitches around 1300. This is where we see awesome mix item 19, and this is a good moment to give that piece the attention it deserves. So, what is it about? Let's move to the next slide. Yes, Paris in the 13th century or the 1200s is a lovely town where much cheer and good company and plenty of good food are to be had. Today we've been wandering aimlessly on the south bank or the Rive Gauche there on the right of the river. That is where Paris University is located. We have seen plenty of students rushing through the busy streets. But now we cross the bridge towards that island in the middle and make our way to Notre Dame Cathedral. In the street before this enormous building is a market. From the distance we can already hear the fruit seller, who has fresh strawberries and mulberries on offer. Fresh strawberries, he cries, quality mulberries, mulberries, quality mulberries. Right now I'm in the company of a student guide, and while we're wandering from stall to stall, he explains to me why Paris is such a fantastic city. Here is what he says. In Paris, morning and evening, you can find good bread and good clear wine, good meat and good fish, every sort of friend, clever wits, great merriment, beautiful, joyous noble women. And in the middle of it all, you can find it at the lowest price for the man short of funds. Unfortunately, it has been difficult to hear my companion, for there is another young man who clearly wants to be my guide instead of this student, and is talking loudly into my other ear. He muses about the hard labor one has to do in the countryside. That kind of life is not for him. Judging from his words, he only wants to hang out with his friends and have fun. Here is what he says. Some speak of threshing and winnowing, of digging and cultivating, but these pleasures quite displease me. For the only good life is to take one's ease with good clear wine and capon, and to be with good friends, happy and joyful, singing and joking and loving, and to have for comfort when in need one's fill of fair ladies. And all this you can find in Paris. Quite how he finances this lifestyle, he doesn't say. But as soon as he disappears in the crowd, I notice my purse has gone missing. It looks like he will be enjoying my financial support in the coming week. Well, never mind. Pickpockets and thieves can come to a very bad end at this time, and I'm not so upset that I, wish, wish, that I would wish that upon him. Let's just enjoy the whole experience, put together musically, in awesome mix item number 19. Fres Oh, my God. 
This is three voices singing together. Let's map the pitches they sing on the diatonic keyboard of Gregorian chant, where the only black key is B flat. Perhaps it was a little hard to follow along with the keyboard, but that's okay. I hope you still like the music. And let me state the key facts. First of all, we can hear the precision of rhythmic notation and can easily count along if you want to. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on. Second, the three singers are moving within a very tight range, one octave plus two steps. That is exactly like the song by Magister Albert of Paris. And yet the fruit seller's voice is at the low end of the range, and the two young men have the rest of it to themselves. Third, the whole piece can be played on the white keys of the Gregorian keyboard, plus those two B flats. At no point did we have to imagine a black key where there isn't one. Now, I said Gregorian keyboard, but actually there's no need to call it that. The only keyboards in existence at this time are diatonic. There's no such thing as black keys, let alone a full-blown chromatic keyboard. It's worth pausing a moment to take a look at an organ from around this time. Here is an illustration showing the biblical King David making music. It is dated around 1260, which is about 20 years before the song about the market at Paris. King David was known as the most prominent musician in the Hebrew Bible. In medieval illustrations, you rarely see him without a musical instrument. Here he is playing the organ, but not the mechanical church organ as we know it. Its invention will be among the great technological achievements of the 14th century. Looking more closely, we see an instrument that closely resembles the old Roman hydraulus. Once again, there are organ pipes in order of decreasing length, going from low on the left to high on the right. At the extreme ends, left and right, there's pipes which are significantly taller than the others. They are drones, sustained low notes meant to sound continuously while King David is playing his tune. Now let's examine this organ the same way we looked at the hydraulus. First, the number of pipes. Unfortunately, King David is blocking our view, so we can't count them. But that problem is easily solved. There is such regularity to the artist's depiction that the number of keys blocked by King David is not hard to guess. Naturally, the number of keys matches the number of organ pipes. Each key controls one pipe. I already mentioned that the leftmost and rightmost pipes are drones. The same is probably true of the second pipe from left. In terms of its length, it must be exactly a fifth above the first pipe. So they will sound together well. Yet there is another gap between the second and third pipes. They cannot be a step apart, as one would expect in a scale. Rather, there is a leap between them of approximately a minor third. So the scale can only begin at the third pipe. Now let's count the pipes that make up this scale all the way up to the long drone pipe at the right.
there is 16 of them. If you play a scale on the white keys of the piano, you'll need exactly 8 keys for one octave, we have seen that in the hydraulics, and exactly 15 for two octaves. So there is one key too many. But that is not actually a problem. Just consider the keyboard that I called Gregorian a moment ago. It is diatonic, that is, white key only. And yet there is one black key, which is B-flat. B that must be the key too many here. So it works out perfectly. Of course, the artist meant to illustrate a manuscript, not to provide us with a detailed building plan for an organ. So we really don't know up to what point he is going to be mathematically exact. But let's look at the organ in the same way that we looked at the hydraulics about a millennium previously. Once again, we begin at the baseline and draw a continuous line there. Now let's go to the shortest pipe, all the way on the right, which sounds the highest pitch, and draw a dotted horizontal line there. After this, let's walk eight steps to the left, which in a diatonic scale is down one octave. Is this pipe twice as long as we, uh, as we would expect? Let's draw another dotted horizontal line at this point and compare the distance. Well, it is not mathematically exact, but close enough to be believable. The real trouble starts after this, for let's walk yet another eight steps to the left, to the very beginning of the scale. That should bring us to the octave below, which should mean a pipe twice as long as the one in the middle. But that is not at all the case. In terms of the length of the organ pipe, we cannot have descended more than a fifth, let alone an octave. This is confusing. For what if you wanted to build this organ based on the image you see before you? What should we decide about those pipes? Well, about 20 years ago, Wienold van der Putten, a builder of historic organs, made a reconstruction. It's called the Rutland organ because the illustration is in the manuscript known as the Rutland Psalter. Here it is. So now, let's first draw the baseline. Then we go to the shortest pipe and we draw a, a dotted horizontal line there. Then we go eight steps to the left, and at that point, in the middle of the row of pipes, we draw another dotted horizontal line. Yes, the pipe at this point is twice as long as the one far right. So the organ builder clearly took those eight pipes to span the distance of an octave. Now, going further left, you'll notice that the angle at which the pipes rise becomes steeper. By the time we reach the beginning of the scale, the pipe length has doubled once again. So we're down another octave. All this is confirmed by the alphabetic letters, which the organ builder has painted on the keys. We can tell from these pitches that awesome mix number 19, the song about the wild strawberries, can be played with the pitches available on this organ. Now, what does the organ sound like? Let's play a short video clip of the Rutland organ in action. Throughout the sample you'll hear a low sustained note, the drone, produced by that long pipe on the left. You'll see right away how the organist can keep that note going without actually pressing the key with his hand. Yes, 
It is a simple piece of lead that keeps the key pressed down. This frees up the left hand to play along with the right. At the same time, it is clear that there isn't much scope for keyboard virtuosity here. In fact, from this instrument, you would scarcely guess that something as spectacular and dazzling as Ravel's left hand piano concerto could one day could one day be played on a keyboard. And it is not hard to see why that is. The keys on the Rutland organ are just too big. They're too wide apart. King David can only play them with one finger per hand. If he spreads out his fingers as wide as possible, the largest interval he can play with one hand would be a fourth. On the modern piano, it would be at least an octave. The reason for this is that each key is placed right before the pipe it controls. So the keys are as far apart as the pipes are. The mechanism that connects the two is not designed to bring keys closer together for the convenience of the player. So virtuosity is out of the question. Black keys would be impractical for the same reason. For if such, are to be, such keys are to be added to the diatonic keyboard, one pipe, one key, the whole thing would spread out and you're going to have to swing your arms wildly about like the player of the bells in a church tower. Of course, it was going to take some ingenuity to, this, to solve this problem and create keys adjusted to your fingers rather than to the organ pipes. But it can be done. And sometime around the year 1400, it was. At this point, I still haven't explained why, where and how chromatic scales were invented. For the moment, that is okay. With developments this important, it's better to understand what happened than take it for granted. And that, understanding, is really necessary in this case. For if you think about it, the developments actually make little sense. Just consider this. In a diatonic scale, steps are labeled with alphabet letters. We saw that on the keys of the Rutland organ a moment ago. Now, if you're going to have a chromatic scale, why not label the chromatic steps in the same way, that is, alphabetically? Why do we have to call them E flat or F sharp, as if they had no identity of their own, but are simply variations of a white key, distinguished only by a little pitch bending? Even stranger, when you look at the keyboard of the modern piano, you'll find only one black key between, for example, the white keys C and D. Surely you'll need only one label for that one black key. So why do people speak of that black key as both C sharp and D flat, as, it, as though there were any significance to the different names? All one can see is on the piano is one key. Why not call that key Q, coming after P and before R? Part of the reason is that new inventions are typically made within the framework of what was invented before. In this sense, a lot develops cumulatively. It was already a major breakthrough when pitches began to be identified by alphabet letters. This happened shortly after the year 1000, as you can see in this time chart. Before that, there was nothing to identify or label pitches at all. And these alphabet letters would provide the framework for the invention of chromatic pitches. Let me take a few moments to explain how that framework was created. It will make the chromatic scale easier to understand. Tradition has it that the first musician to develop the system of alphabet letters was an Italian monk by the name of Guido, Guido of Arezzo. Here you see him on the left, with a small head and small feet, but a sizable posterior in between. Since Guido is the most famous musician of the 11th century, the artist decided to show him doing what musicians do, and that is, finding out things on the monochord. He has found a bishop named Theodaldus to hold the other end of the monochord for him. To refresh your memory, here are the three most harmonic intervals and their mathematical proportions as demonstrated on the monochord. The lowest note is the whole string. The octave is half the string. 
The fifth is two thirds of the string. And the fourth is three fourths of the string. And back to the whole string. It never gets old, this stuff. But how are you going to find a practical way to label pitches, to find a way of referring to them? That's the question Guido asked himself. To understand his solution, let's start by considering this series of pitches going from low to high. And let's think about the question in terms of the diatonic scale. Scales, by definition, encompass the range of one octave. An octave is kind of like the same pitch, but different. It's like Monday next week is not the same day as Monday this week, but still has many things in common. The lecture for this class, for example. And so we call them both Monday. Actually, that's not even a bad analogy. For it takes seven weekdays before you have another Monday. And in the same way, it takes seven steps before you reach the octave. So all we need is seven labels for the steps just like we have seven names for the days of the week. For this purpose, decided Guido, the first seven letters of the alphabet will do just fine. So, here we are. Starting with A, we go through seven diatonic steps before we're back on another A. We can keep going like this into the next octave. And the one after that. And yet, there is one pitch that we haven't labeled yet, at the very beginning of the scale. It comes before A, just like there are people who want to start counting the weekdays on Sunday rather than Monday. That unlabeled pitch can only be a G, of course. But how should I go about writing it? We already have capital G and lowercase g, so these we can't use. If I extended the scale beyond the highest note shown here, I would designate the first G after that as double lowercase g, just like the other steps in that octave. But how should we expand the series at the lower end? Guido decided to use the Greek letter for G, which is called gamma. One of the helpful things about this is that we can give these same labels to the lines in a stave as well as to the spaces in between. The red line here, for example, stands for F. So if we want to indicate that this is the F line, all we need to do is write the letter on that line, preferably at the beginning of the stave. Believe it or not, that clef you see at the beginning of the stave is in fact the letter F. It is highly stylized, to be sure. But if you trace back the history of that stylization, it soon becomes clear how the present clef got its distinctive shape. The same is true of that line which represents G. I admit I have difficulty reading that symbol at the beginning of the stave as the letter G rather than just a fancy curl. But if you look at it historically, then yes, one can see how we got there. After all this, the important thing for Guido was to make absolutely certain that this scale would be always diatonic and would never have the slightest hint of chromaticism. Remember that he was devising all this for plain chant, so he had to avoid any kind of pitch that could cause a diabolus in musica, the devil in music. Guido made history with his invention of the hexachord, which literally means six strings. When you hear the six successive pitches, it sounds like a scale, except it's not a complete one, but shorter. The best way to think of the hexachord is as a template, a template for melodic movement. Look at that step in the middle, marked S. The letter S stands for semitone or half a tone, and whole tone, of course, is T. That semitone sounds perfectly fine in this hexachord, but the one thing you do not want is to have two of them in succession, for that is chromaticism. And chromaticism is the thing he wants to avoid more than anything else. That is exactly why he has placed the S in the middle. So long as you stick to the pitches of the hexachord, there is no risk of singing two semitones in succession.
Even if you want to leave the hexachord, you first have to pass through two whole tones in either direction before there is even the risk of singing another semitone. So this template, the hexachord, brings a kind of safety. The next thing Guido does is give each of the steps in the hexachord its own name. These names are just nonsense syllables. Ut, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La. You may have come across the better known variant, Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, like so. Guido got the syllables from a plain chant called Ut, Que, and Laxis. There was a peculiarity about this chant that made it really useful for his purposes. The first phrase starts on the pitch C. That is the phrase ut queant laxis, top left. The second phrase, resonare fibris, begins on D. And here comes the peculiarity. The next few phrases go on like this, each starting one step higher than the previous one. This is what it sounds like. With all this, Guido had invented a new pedagogy, one that would remain in use until the present day, nearly a thousand years by now. The didactic importance of the hexachord is illustrated by this video clip from the movie The Sound of Music. We see Julie Andrews as Maria, a young nun who serves as the governess to seven children who used to be intractable but are now eating out of her hand. When you know the notes to sing, you can sing most anything. Once these syllables of the hexachord have been firmly drilled in the brain, we can move on to the next pedagogical step. This is to take the long scale with the alphabet letters and tell singers that they must never sing any of these pitches unless they identify them in terms of the hexachord steps. For example, when a step is called A, it doesn't mean a thing unless you also know that it is the step Mi in a particular hexachord. There are severe restrictions on the hexachords you can use. In fact, Guido limited the number of permissible hexachords to just seven. Here they are. So, now there is not a single step in the alphabetic scale or its pitch is defined by either one, two or three hexachord syllables.
After this detour, it's time to return to where we left off, which is the decades around the year 1300. We have already listened to awesome mix number 19, the motet in praise of uh, 13th century Paris. But now we are going to listen to a somewhat later item from the mix, number 23, a motet in Middle French with the title Le Suspirant Coeur. The composer is Guillaume de Machaut, one of the greatest musical minds of the 14th century. There's a little picture of him in your textbook, but it gives only an approximate idea of his likeness. More useful are the manuscript illuminations, which show Machaut in old age. They were made by artists who worked under his direct supervision, so they knew him personally. At that point in the composer's life, he had gone almost completely blind. This may explain why he looks so conspicuously cross-eyed. Awesome mix item number 23, Machaut's Le Suspirant Coeur, probably dates about 50 years after the song about life in Paris. Let's listen to it and follow along on that same keyboard we used in the older piece. As you'll remember, this keyboard consists almost wholly of white keys. But we will soon find that Marshall uses several new pitches that don't exist on this keyboard. Each time we hear him use a new one, the relevant black key will light up and then remain black for the rest of the sample. This way we can keep track of the new additions. The point is for us to get some sense of the changes that had occurred in that span of about 50 years. Are we talking of just a few isolated chromatic pitches? Or are we looking at something approaching the full-blown chromatic keyboard? Let's find out. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the sound of the 14th century. Take any of the awesome mix items 21 to 26, which together span the 14th century, and you'll hear the music of people who just couldn't get enough of chromaticism. The sound may seem a little weird at first, but if you're like me, it will grow on you, and you'll marvel at music that is so strangely original and creative. For now, I just want to point out that we can witness a parallel development in the history of keyboard instruments. Look at this illumination from right around the time of Machaut's Le Suspirant Coeur. See that keyboard there? Well, let me tell you about an interesting professional deformation among musicologists who work on the 14th century. The vague outline alone uh, of the instrument are enough to trigger a kind of Pavlov response in them. The moment they see it, they will have no peace until they've had a chance to look at the keyboard more closely. Will it be chromatic? Will there be black keys? Well, today they're in luck. Let's zoom in. Ah, yes, there they are, black keys. And they are nicely fitted to the human hand. What a satisfying sight. And these are only our first steps into a new age of musical discovery. 
the chromatic keyboard is just the beginning. There are other critically important developments that continue to shape and condition musical life to this day. It will be the goal of the next lecture to hear them, appreciate them, and understand them.